I don't see this going much longer uh, because people are being driven crazy. Nobody has any savings anymore. So production is being sucked into oblivion. And eventually when we can no longer produce and we're busy just like making money through basis trade, shuffling paper, and that's where the money is coming from and nobody's producing anything anymore, then then what? how can this continue? You're watching Silver News Daily. Like this video and subscribe to the channel for the best news that you don't want to miss. Now let's get straight to it. Silver's unseen rally, the looming financial tsunami's golden parachute. Imagine this, a world where your bank stability is no longer a guarantee, where the very foundation of our financial system starts to tremble under the weight of its own complexities. Yes, you heard that right. The banking system, once considered an unshakable pillar of economic stability, is now on the brink of a seismic shift that could see it crumbling down like a house of cards. And amidst this looming chaos, there's a silver lining, quite literally. The price of silver is on the verge of hitting historic highs, a rally to records never before seen, with predictions soaring as high as $4,589. Now you might wonder, why silver? And why now? Well, stick around, because what we're about to unfold is not just a tale of economic forecast, but a beacon of opportunity and the turbulence that lies ahead. So before we dive deeper into this vortex, let's make one thing clear. This isn't just another financial speculation, this is a call to action, a strategy to safeguard your wealth against the impending storm. And by the end of this journey, you'll see exactly why stocking up on silver now could be the best decision you'll ever make. Don't forget to subscribe as we embark on this fascinating exploration, unraveling why the impending banking system crash is a ticking time bomb for the unprepared but a golden parachute for those who see the silver surge coming. Uh, quantitatively, uh, the bank term funding program, um, just in very simple terms, is banks can give the Fed all their treasuries and then get the face value of it in a loan for a year for uh, the reserves. Uh, and those reserves have to be paid back. So numerically, what it means is the, the bank term funding program started on March 11th, ends on March 11th, but most of the loans, the big chunk of the loans, were made by April 5th, and those have to be paid back. And I think I think it's something between 70 and 80 billion dollars um, were made of loans uh, were made by April 5th. So, if the program is not renewed, we're going to have to see the equivalent of about 80 billion dollars in quantitative tightening uh, QT when these loans are paid back. Because when when a bank, let's say, pays back the loan to the Fed, and then they get their they get their underwater treasuries back because it was a swap, then all the money, all the dollars that they pay to the Fed to pay back that loan, they those dollars go out of existence, right? They're not spent by the Fed back into the system. That would be QE again. So quantitatively, we're going to see something between 80 and $100 billion of quantitative tightening by April 5th. And if there are no more reverse repos in the system and they're draining fast now, I think they're down the last time I checked was a few minutes ago. I think it's $500 billion now, so we're down to our last half trillion. Um, there's going to be a crunch probably in the repo market, probably in the overnight lending market, like something like we saw in September 2019, but not exactly that. I don't know exactly what it's going to be. It could be more banks failing, just like we saw with um, New York Community New York Community Bank Corp, I think it's called. Uh, that was yesterday. I think they, they didn't collapse completely, but they had this big loss, $100, $150 million loss from a, an office loan that went bad, a single office loan. Um, and a co-op loan. There's so many banks that have a lot of office loans, uh, commercial real estate loans, that if one of them goes bad, all of a sudden, uh, what they thought was going to be like, let's say, a $300 million profit for the quarter or for the for the quarter ends up to be like a $300 million loss. And then investors are, don't know what to do and they sell the bank and then you start a contagion. This is definitely going to cause a contagion at some point. And uh, the cancellation or the ending of the bank term funding program. As we peel back the layers of our global financial system, it becomes evident that the roots of instability run deep. Starting with the vulnerabilities of the banking system, a picture of fragility begins to emerge, brought into sharp relief by the cessation of the bank term funding program, BTFP. This was no minor footnote in the annals of financial history. It was a lifeline that kept the banks afloat during turbulent times. And now, with its end, we stand on the precipice of a tightening financial noose, one that could strangle the very lifeblood of our economic stability. But it's not just the mechanics of banking that spell trouble. Cast your gaze across the globe to the geopolitical chessboard, where tensions simmer and occasionally boil over. These aren't just distant skirmishes on a map. 
They're harbingers of financial uncertainty, each conflict another reason for savvy investors to seek refuge in the timeless value of silver. And then there's inflation, a specter haunting the wallets and savings of ordinary people. It's not just numbers on a page, it's the erosion of purchasing power, the creeping doubt in the currency that was once a bedrock of stability. Inflation drives a wedge between saving and spending, pushing more into the realm of doomed spending, a frantic search for assets that won't vanish into thin air, like so much fiat currency. The collapse of Evergrande, a giant in the Chinese real estate market, isn't just a corporate failure, it's a domino that threatens to topple others in its path, sending shockwaves through the global economy. This isn't an isolated incident, it's a symptom of a deeper malaise, one that underscores the precariousness of our financial systems and the need for a safe haven like silver. It all comes down to this, in a world awash with uncertainty, where the ground beneath our financial institutions quakes with instability, silver stands as a beacon of security. It's not just an investment, it's a lifeline in an ocean of volatility, a testament to the enduring value of precious metals in times of crisis. So as we navigate this complex landscape, the question isn't why invest in silver, it's how quickly can you do so? The impending banking system crash isn't just a possibility, it's an inevitability, a storm on the horizon that promises to reshape the financial world. And in that world, silver isn't just a commodity, it's a currency of the resilient, a bulwark against the tempest. Remember to subscribe to our channel for more insights into making informed financial decisions in these tumultuous times. I wouldn't exactly call it reckless spending. Um, it's more of giving up. It's, it's, it's sort of like, um, what's that word? Not like nihilistic spending. Not nihilistic in terms of these people just want to die, but they just they don't care about the dollars anymore. It's like the analogy that I use a lot is the apple tree. Once the far, if if the if the guy's losing apples in his backyard, but he doesn't notice because his his neighbor is clandestinely taking them, then he won't do much about it, and he'll keep tending the tree and growing the apples. But if he realizes that the that his neighbor's just taking all his apples, he'll cut down the tree, because why why should he feed his neighbor? He'll, t he'll cut down the tree, take what he can, and and that's it. Um, and that's that's what happens. In hyper that is hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is the change in psychology from I'm going to try to save even though e even though prices are rising. I'm going to try to save, uh, as opposed to uh, look look at ha look at housing prices. Look how much it costs to rise to raise a family. I'm not even going to try to reproduce. I'm not going to try to raise a family. I'm not even going to try to build to to build or buy a house. I'm just going to spend uh, on you know a lambskin tote bag and make myself feel better. Um, but that, that's, that's one stage. Then the next stage is I got to get rid of this money immediately and buy whatever I can find on the shelves. I don't care what it is. That's, that's hyperinflation. But I wanted, I wanted to bring this to the, the point of, um, back to silver again, because what, I mean, back in the nineties when I was a kid, right, there was still inflation, but you could still, you know, hold on to a wad of cash. And like, you know, as a kid, you could smell it and it smells like money and it makes you proud. And like, and you're like, no, I don't want to spend, like you have a, you have an instinct. You don't, at least some people have it more, some people have less. I don't want to spend this because this is my money. And if I spend it now on this, I won't be able to spend it later on something else. So you have a natural incl inclination to save. But if, if, if we're talking about a silver coin, Right uh, versus, let's say, a digital number in a bank account. When you log into and you see a number on a on a on a screen, you have a thousand dollars. Versus, you have a thousand dollars in weight in silver. If you pay, if you start young and you make kids understand what money is and what saving really is, like saving real hard money, it's a shiny coin. They want. They, it's even more of an instinct to hold on to it to save it, as opposed to like a dollar bill, which is eh, it's it's nice, but it's just a piece of paper. As opposed to even further from that, a derivative of that, which is you know a, a number you see on a screen, right? So if you train your kids to uh, to earn silver or to earn real money for chores they do around the house, then they 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 become immune to this despair nihilism that they see when the monetary system is falling apart. Because they say, look, I have silver; it's going up. So the, this is the the reason that they're becoming so despairing is because they don't know what money is, and our job when this is over is when their dollars are no longer worth anything and they have like a tote bag from the you know the splurge that they did today to make themselves feel better, then we can say okay we have money we can start over, and uh, and 
even these people, they have their their role to play, right? There's no qualitative difference between, between emptying your dollars to buy a tote bag and emptying or some luxury item, some luxury consumer item, and emptying your dollars to buy gold and silver. I'm not saying to empty them, but we need everyone to come in and empty their dollars for anything they can, and that means the dollar is dead. We, we're just doing it more responsibly than they are, but they're coming to the conclusion that we're coming to just in a much more superficial way, but it's essentially the same thing. Diving into the geopolitical tensions that underpin much of the world's current financial uncertainty, it becomes crucial to understand how these pressures contribute to the burgeoning appeal of silver as a safe haven. The specter of conflict, especially in regions fraught with historical and contemporary strife, such as northern Israel, presents a vivid illustration of the broader geopolitical unrest impacting global markets. Amidst these tensions, the concept of preparedness, both physical and financial, emerges as a theme of paramount importance. Rafi Farber's insights from Israel underscore a palpable sense of urgency, a recognition that the fabric of our daily lives can be altered dramatically by geopolitical events. It's this undercurrent of instability that propels investors towards assets untethered from the volatility of currencies and the whims of governments. Silver, in this context, isn't just a metal. It's a bastion of stability in a world where the geopolitical landscape shifts with the news cycle. The allure of silver grows as the global theater of conflict reminds us of the fragility of our financial systems. In times of geopolitical tension, the value of traditional investments can erode as swiftly as trust in diplomatic resolutions. Silver's appeal, conversely, shines brighter against the backdrop of uncertainty. It becomes more than just an asset. It transforms into a symbol of resilience, a choice for those looking to shield their wealth from the unpredictable outcomes of geopolitical unrest. As we navigate through these tumultuous times, the call to action for viewers is clear. Considering silver as part of your investment portfolio isn't just prudent, it's a strategic move to safeguard against the unpredictable tides of geopolitical tensions. As always, we encourage you to engage with us in the comments below. What are your thoughts on silver as a safe haven asset in light of global tensions? How do you prepare financially for the unpredictability of geopolitical events? Your insights enrich our community's dialogue, fostering a deeper understanding of the critical decisions facing investors today. And remember, subscribing to our channel ensures you stay informed on the latest trends and strategies for navigating the complex interplay of finance and geopolitics. Stay tuned for more analysis and insights into making your wealth resilient against the storms on the horizon. Well, I, I heard something interesting from Monaco64 from Mario, and he told he told me that the FDIC, for whatever reason, is like two weeks late in issuing its uh, state of the banking system quarterly report. I don't know why. I would just expect, you know, Occam's razor, maybe they're lazy, maybe somebody had a cold, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, the conspiratorial mindset that I can't really seem to get out of these days is that they're trying to hide something or cook the books or whatever, or something doesn't look very good. I mean, we just saw today that New York Community Bank Corp is pretty much dead now. They, they so, like, it, it was a surprise to people. I just wrote this on, on the Endgame Investor on Substack that, like, I think New, uh, NYCB, New York Community Bank Corp has... Like it's it has a few days left and then it's done. And then, well, bam, now today, well, like, whoa, they, they announced, oh, they need a cash infusion. Why do you think they need a cash infusion? Because when there's bad news about a bank, like people take their cash out. <laughs> that's, that's what happens every time. So what do you expect? Um, as, as for the, the bank term funding program, yeah, it's coming to an end on March 11th. Um, but the question, the, the issue isn't necessarily when it comes to an end, but when the loans that were taken out come due. And that's an, that's, a big chunk of the loans um, are uh, are due by April 9th, 10th, 11th, something like that, because it took time for banks to actually start taking the loans. So I think if I remember the numbers correctly, it's like $70 billion. That could be off, whatever. It's a lot of money. And that's all going to have to come off the Fed's balance sheet because they now have the assets that back those loans and they're going to give back those assets to the banks, which are the underwater treasuries that they took on their balance sheet. And then the banks are going to give them the money back. The Fed's going to take the money you know, uh, blast it out of existence or whatever the appropriate verb is. And uh, then their balance sheet will shrink. And uh, there is there is a fault line. There is a, um, a tectonic plate somewhere uh, on that balance sheet where once they hit that, there's going to be some plumbing problems in the repo markets, which is the underwater dungeons where all the mass... Uh, scale funding is done, overnight funding. And if there aren't enough liquid uh liquid securities in that dungeon 
which is represented by the Fed's balance sheet, then something gets clogged like it did in September 2019. Is that going to happen again? Yeah. Do I know exactly when? No. But uh, the loans coming back, the, the BTFB, Bank Term Funding Program loans coming back to the Fed, they're going to take us closer to that number, wherever it is. And whatever it is, and something happens the next day, people are going to come up with research papers and put them through AI. And they're going to say, oh, we should have known that, you know, and then uh, we'll be ready for the next crisis, but we won't. <laughs> so it seems like a possible liquidity crisis then if if the banks are going to have to essentially give back all this cash that they have um, and they got from the Fed, you know, in exchange for those underwater treasuries, then the money supply is going to be shrinking and there's there possibly could be a liquidity problem in the bank, uh, banks coming going forward? Not necessarily the money supply will be shrinking, though it, it, it probably will. But what shrinks is the really the monetary base. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you want to say that that if the banks are giving cash back to the Fed, um, the money supply shrinks, but not not really because not at least not directly because they put those they the banks put the the treasuries back on their balance sheet and it becomes part of the money supply. In today's economic climate, where inflation looms large over our financial security, understanding its impact on our spending and saving habits is more crucial than ever. With inflation rates spiraling. A phenomenon Rafi Farber terms as doom spending emerges, where the psychology of consumption shifts dramatically. People, confronted with the eroding value of their money, start to invest in tangible assets, fearing tomorrow's uncertainty. This psychological pivot towards safeguarding wealth leads many to silver, an asset whose historical stability shines in times of economic turmoil. Inflation doesn't just nibble away at your purchasing power, it devours it, forcing a revaluation of what financial security truly means. In a world where the money in your pocket buys less and less each day, the allure of silver becomes undeniable. It's not merely about investing, it's about preserving the value of your hard-earned wealth against the invisible tax of inflation. The shift towards tangible assets like silver isn't a panic move. It's a strategic one, grounded in a deep understanding of history and economics. As fiat currencies waver under the weight of unchecked inflation, silver remains steadfast, a testament to its enduring value. This isn't just about the here and now, it's about positioning oneself for a future where the true cost of today's inflation becomes all too apparent. So as we grapple with these challenging economic times, the question isn't whether you can afford to invest in silver, it's whether you can afford not to. Amidst the uncertainty, silver offers a beacon of stability, a way to shield your wealth from the ravages of inflation. As we continue to explore the multifaceted impact of inflation on our financial landscape, we encourage you to engage with us. Have you felt the urge to pivot towards doom spending? How do you view silver's role in your strategy to combat inflation's effects? Share your thoughts and experiences in the comments below, fostering a community dialogue that enriches our collective understanding and approach to financial preparedness. Don't forget, subscribing to our channel not only keeps you informed, but also ensures you're part of a community dedicated to navigating these turbulent financial waters together. Stay tuned for more insights and strategies to safeguard your financial future in an inflationary world. Uh, yeah, I looked back into the 70s, and thanks for reminding me about that. I thought that was a pretty good comparison. Um, in the 1970s, right, 1971, Nixon closes the gold window, and then all the gold and silver bugs who understood what real money was back then, and a lot more people understood what real money was back then than now, because we've been so separated from it for so long that we don't even know what it is anymore. Um, even I don't. I mean, I know intellectually what it is and I can I can put the concepts in my hand but in my head but it's hard for me to understand that you take a silver coin you give it to somebody and that's money and you pay them and it has nothing to do with the name on the coin it has to do with the weight of the thing right I've never experienced that before but I'm going to get back to it so the 1970s uh, anyway uh 1971 he closes the gold window and then gold and silver don't do much for a year you know they even go down and the gold bugs are like oh hey, well, you know, what's going on this is crazy this doesn't make any sense and then the Keynes are like, well, we told you that. The reason that people have demand for gold is because of dollars, not the other way around. And then, you know, we're like, what are you talking about? And if Bitcoin existed back then, it would be like, uh, you know, <laughs> that that would still be a, you know, a popular thing if it was in the 70s because of the closing the gold window. But I digress. We saw that uh, that that from, I think, from 1972 to 74, gold and silver went up into what was at that point a parabolic top. I don't remember exactly what the number was, um, but it was the highest ever seen for either metals at that point. And then for like five years, silver did pretty much nothing. 
Um, it went down. It had a, it had a bottom two years later, I think in 1977, 76, 77, something like that. It took two years to bottom, and then it slowly climbed its way back up until 1979 when it hit the 1975 high. And then 1979, 1980, we all know what happened. Everything just went crazy. So uh, I'm seeing the same pattern now that, uh, that, you know, if we mark 1971 as 2020, when, you know, there was like a, a, a sort of a monetary reset where cause it's not, it's not the exact same thing. Nothing ever is. But if you count that as the beginning, then uh, we made a high into 2021, uh, a double top, let's call that 1975. And uh, and then we went down into 2022, just two years later from 2020. Let's call that 1977. And then we should be around 1978, 1979 right now if patterns repeat. Uh, and markets do spiral. They have repeating patterns. Doesn't mean everything has to be exactly the same. Doesn't mean that we have one year left exactly because it has to be 1980. But the point of these historical comparisons is to remind us that markets don't always do what they're logically supposed to do immediately, but in the end, they always do. So we just have to keep that in mind and understand conceptually what reality is, which is gold and silver are money and everything else is based on that. And we'll get back to ground level pretty soon, I think, because things are spiraling out of control politically, socially, economically. Egypt is now hyperinflating right to the to the west of me. The the the, e the Egyptian pound was just allowed to float, and now there's hyperinflation over there. Hyperinflation in Lebanon. Hyperinflation in Syria. I don't know what's going on in Jordan, but like war over here. In the shadow of <laughs> Nothing... towering economic uncertainties, the collapse of Evergrande in China serves as a stark reminder of the fragility inherent within the global real estate market. This isn't just a tale of corporate overreach; it's a harbinger of potential crisis points that could ripple through economies worldwide, underscoring the interconnectedness of our financial systems. As Evergrande teetered on the brink of failure, the specter of a real estate crisis in China became all too real, threatening to pull the global economy into its vortex. This situation illuminates a critical truth about the nature of financial security in the modern world. It's not just about the assets you hold, but the stability of the markets they inhabit. The collapse of a giant like Evergrande doesn't just affect those directly invested, it sends shockwaves through the economy, affecting investor confidence and the stability of global markets. In such times, the quest for safe havens becomes more pronounced, with investors turning to assets uncorrelated with the fortunes of real estate or equities. This is where silver, with its timeless value, comes into play. Silver's appeal in the face of such crises is twofold. Firstly, it offers a tangible asset in an increasingly digital and abstract financial world providing a sense of security that is hard to replicate with stocks or bonds. Secondly, its historical performance in times of economic uncertainty makes it a compelling choice for those looking to diversify away from sectors prone to volatility, like real estate. The lesson here is clear. In an era marked by towering debts and speculative bubbles, the wisdom of incorporating silver into one's investment portfolio becomes undeniable. It's not just about seeking growth, it's about protecting against loss, about ensuring that the foundation of your financial house is as secure as it can be in a world of uncertainty. As we ponder the implications of Evergrande's collapse and the vulnerabilities of the real estate market, it's crucial to engage in a broader conversation about financial preparedness and the role of precious metals in safeguarding our economic future. I invite you to share your thoughts and strategies in the comments below. How do you view the role of silver in an investment portfolio, especially in light of potential real estate market instabilities? Remember, subscribing to our channel not only keeps you informed on the latest financial trends and insights, but also connects you with a community of like-minded individuals committed to navigating the complexities of the financial landscape together. Stay tuned for more in-depth analysis and strategies to fortify your financial well-being in these uncertain times. Frankly, I'm surprised. Um, I'm surprised because the Fed hasn't done anything yet. And the money supply is still more or less shrinking. I mean, bank credit has been growing lately, and I'm not even sure why exactly that's happening. Uh, my guess is that uh, that high interest rate debt is increasing because people are maxing out their credit cards. You can see that on credit cards. So since money and debt are both our opposite sides of the same fiat coin, uh, the more debt that people go into, the more money supply there is because of the fractional reserve bank system, as we all know. So um, uh, that's if that's why the money supply is growing, uh, it's not the Fed doing it. 
and really why should gold be hitting new highs now before they start printing again so i think that's a pretty good sign that when they do uh things could get really intense like uh gold moving hundreds of dollars a day um and it's not just going to go straight up there's going to be days where it gets scary down because there's going to be dollar crunches here and there where you know banks need their dollars so they uh, shut down things or call in loans and you start to see deflationary forces and then inflationary forces the next day. I mean, it's going to get pretty crazy and you have to understand conceptually, not every day what's happening, but basically what is going to happen as things start to fly out of control and you got to be prepared for both directions. So I'm excited. I'm also a little bit antsy and nervous, but I try to acknowledge my emotions without being too affected by them because I know what the end game is and as we navigate the murky waters of today's economic landscape, it's imperative to anchor ourselves with assets that stand the test of time and uncertainty. Amid the swirling storm of banking system vulnerabilities, geopolitical unrest, and inflationary pressures, gold and silver emerge not just as mere commodities, but as beacons of financial security. This conversation isn't just about diversification. It's a fundamental revaluation of what constitutes a safe investment in an era marked by unprecedented global economic instability. The intrinsic value of precious metals like silver has been recognized for millennia, serving as currency, a store of value, and a hedge against economic turmoil. In today's context, where traditional financial systems show signs of strain, silver's role becomes even more critical. It's about more than just the allure of the metal. It's about its proven ability to maintain value when other assets falter. Stacking silver isn't merely a strategy, it's a philosophy a commitment to preserving wealth in a form that transcends the vicissitudes of fiat currencies and volatile stock markets. It's about recognizing that, in times of economic uncertainty, the true value of an asset lies in its enduring stability and universal acceptance. The general economic uncertainty and the vulnerabilities of the banking system we discussed underscore the strategic role of silver. It's not just an alternative investment, it's a foundational element of a robust financial defense strategy offering a refuge for those seeking to navigate the complexities of the modern economic environment. As we conclude this exploration of silver's indispensable role in safeguarding financial security, I urge you to reflect on the broader implications of our current economic challenges. Consider how incorporating precious metals into your portfolio could fortify your financial future against the unpredictable tides of global markets. I invite you to join the conversation below, share your thoughts on the role of silver in today's economy, and have your planning to leverage its timeless value in your investment strategy. Your insights and strategies enrich our collective understanding and approach to financial preparedness. Um, what do I say to them? Don't, it's, it's not about dollar profits, right? It's not about um, earning dollars with gold. It's about having gold, uh, having money, having gold and silver. It doesn't have to be gold. It can be silver. It depends what you can afford. It depends what you want. Um, but you need some money and it's not, it's not a thing that you want to like take a position in and then try to sell it for a dollar profit and then calculate how many, much stuff you can get with that dot with those dollars. It's, <clears throat> it's about, you get a paycheck, right? And you're paid in fake money. So take some of that paycheck and get some silver, do it every month and stop. Don't even look at the price. It's not, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, and I will say this that I've noticed that I also wrote this on the end game investor that the all time highs in gold, they are not being reflected in the physical markets. I don't think um, from the premiums that I'm seeing, they've, they're falling and they're not being reflected in the ETFs, meaning the retail investors are not really part of this. It seems because if they were buying GLD, GLD would be, there would be inflows of gold into GLD, but they're still flowing out. So what this seems to me to be is a banker war between banks and maybe family offices. It's, it's focusing on the futures market. And those are, that's where the big money is. They don't mess with ETFs. They're not retail investors. Some big money does, but most of it is in the futures market because all the leverage is there. Um, and I saw this, we saw this leading up to March, 2020 for about a year, open interest was just heading higher and higher and higher and higher. We're coming off a low in open interest in gold, open interest is the amount of contracts that are open. We, we got up something like 800,000 on the eve of the lockdowns. Um, and open interest is up something like six, 60,000 contracts. I think it's like 15% of the total open interest from three days ago, um, over the last three days. So there's some kind of 
bank battle going on here and the stackers are not really involved they're on the periphery right now um when they get involved price will go much higher um they're not involved right now so i don't see this um i don't see this rally stalling uh, anytime soon it is interesting because there's no uh, you know overhead resistance in gold right and we have had a few years of consolidation so it's not like we've been running straight up or anything. So it does seem like there's a lot of room potentially for gold to rise from here. Yeah. I'm the, the people that I listen to, um, and I'm not a technical trader, so I listen to, to technical traders because that, that's not my, my talent. I want to know what they think. Um, cause that's how they see the market. So when I listen to them, they're like, they, they say, look, I'm a technical trader, but you know, I understand fundamentals also, and I can't understand why gold isn't just heading straight up from here because the world is insane. And when the world is insane, people go to gold and silver because it's, it's, it's grounding and they want to have something in their hands that they can feel and know that they can wake up tomorrow and it'll still be there. So they're, they're kind of losing it and, and, and they don't understand. And you know, frankly, neither do I, but it's okay. I, I know everything's on a delay. I know it's going to happen later. Um, so yeah, and on the one hand, I'm surprised. On the other hand, it's about time and we're living in that dialectic until bam, something happens. And then you wake up the next morning and gold is like 10, 15, $20,000 an ounce and your dollars can't buy anything. Could it be tomorrow? I don't think it's going to be tomorrow, but it's in March, 2023, the banking sector witnessed a crisis that reverberated through the corridors of financial institutions globally. The collapse of Silicon Valley bank SVB brought to light vulnerabilities in the U.S. financial system, underscoring a pivotal moment for investors and savers alike. This wasn't just about a single bank's failure. It was a stark reminder of the fragility inherent in our banking systems, magnified by a volatile economic environment. SVB's downfall was precipitated by a combination of factors, including significant exposure to fixed income securities, which suffered losses as interest rates rose, the rapid withdrawal of deposits, a phenomenon akin to a modern-day bank run, underscored the precarious balance banks must maintain between liquidity and investment strategies. This event highlighted a critical question. How can individuals protect their wealth in an era marked by such financial instability? The answer, for many, lies in the enduring value of silver. Amid the unfolding chaos of SBB's collapse, silver stood as a beacon of stability. Its appeal wasn't merely in its tangible value, but in its historical role as a safe haven during times of financial turmoil. As traditional financial institutions showed signs of weakness, the luster of silver shone brighter, offering a hedge against the unpredictability of the banking sector and the broader economy. Investing in silver, in the wake of SB's collapse, isn't merely a reaction to a singular event. It's a strategic move towards safeguarding one's financial future. It's a testament to the timeless wisdom of diversifying one's portfolio with assets that can withstand the shocks and stresses that may beset the banking industry and the global economy at large. This event serves as a critical lesson for investors, the importance of preparing for uncertainty. The collapse of SBB has laid bare the vulnerabilities in the banking system, urging us to consider the role of precious metals like silver in providing a buffer against such crises. As we continue to unpack the lessons from SBB's collapse, I encourage you to share your thoughts on the role of silver in today's investment landscape. How do you view the stability of the banking system? And how has it influenced your approach to diversifying your investments? Um, like a Keynesian style recession where the GDP goes down. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I try not to follow these numbers too closely because I know it's just, the, it's it's also an illusion. Like GDP is an illusion. It's just basically the money supply. Like it calculates how many dollars are circulating. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's completely meaningless. There is a meaning to it. It does correlate with something. But uh, if... If the money supply is going down, there will be a recession because GDP is how much money is circulating. And if it goes down, it means people are poorer or feel poorer. Um, so, I mean, what I'm thinking is that the last, th the last factor that is keeping the money supply steady to growing is, first of all, um, what I said before is the the high interest rate debt and credit cards that, that Gen Zers are doom spending and just buying whatever they can because they've given up on saving and raising a family and living a normal human life. Um, this, this is one of the stages of hyperinflation, right? You just, you stop trying to, you stop, you just get off the treadmill and you're like, forget it. I'm just going to buy whatever and get rid of my dollars, which is the same thing as stacking really, except with lesser quality uh, goods and services, right? If you're going to 
if you're going to buy a if you're going to like buy a pack of gum versus you know a brick of gold a brick of gold is uh or a coin of gold sorry is uh, is more liquid than a pack of gum but it's they're still both a flight to real goods right it's the same thing conceptually uh so are we going to have a keynesian style recession if the money supply keeps shrinking yeah if the reverse repos run out and we hit something yeah if there's a financial crisis and then debt starts to default that all shrinks the money supply even faster and then people are in recession um you know uh just to go back to egypt for a second are the people that had pounds and now they have a lot less are they in recession yeah what about the people in egypt that have gold they have a lot more purchasing power now than they did yesterday they're fine so uh if you want to stay out of recession yourself get some money if you want to be part of the recession be part of the fake money you know the banking system's liquidity stress a topic brought into sharp focus following recent financial upheavals stands as a vivid testament to the delicate balance between solvency and crisis in an era where rapid interest rate rises have become the norm the vulnerabilities of banks to sudden liquidity shortfalls have never been more apparent this environment not only stresses the financial system's underpinnings but also fundamentally alters how investors perceive safety and stability in their investment choices liquidity stress essentially the mismatch between a bank's liquid assets and its short-term liabilities becomes a crucible for testing the resilience of financial institutions when banks face difficulty covering short-term withdrawals the specter of a liquidity crisis looms echoing the concerns that led to the collapse of notable banks in 2023 such events underscore the precariousness of relying solely on traditional banking structures for financial security and asset growth in response to this instability the allure of silver becomes increasingly pronounced amidst the turbulence of banking sector uncertainties silver stands as a bastion of stability offering investors a tangible asset that historically retains value independent of the financial system's vicissitudes its intrinsic value derived from both industrial demand and investment appeal provides a hedge against the liquidity stress that plagues banks making it an attractive alternative for those seeking to diversify their portfolios away from traditional financial instruments the wisdom of integrating silver into one's investment strategy is not merely a reactionary measure to current banking system vulnerabilities, but a proactive approach to building a resilient portfolio. By allocating assets into silver, investors not only shield themselves from the immediate impacts of liquidity crisis, but also position themselves to benefit from silver's potential appreciation in an environment where traditional investments may falter. As we continue to navigate the complexities of the current economic landscape, the role of silver as a safe haven asset becomes ever more critical. It invites us to reassess our investment strategies, encouraging a broader perspective that values stability and tangible worth in the face of systemic liquidity challenges. I encourage you to join the discussion below, sharing your insights on how the liquidity stress in the banking system has influenced your approach to investing, particularly in assets like silver. How do you balance the need for liquidity with the desire for stability and growth in your portfolio? Yeah, I think in the next few months, something is going to hit and something is going to start spiraling out of control. But um, I want to use that term carefully, like spiraling out of control, because like, what are they trying to control? They're trying to control an illusion of debt that can keep being paid, that keeps circling in on itself and can pay itself off. And then it's spinning faster and faster and faster. We see the, the eye of the, hurric of the hurricane and treasury bills that are now six trillion dollars of this stuff cycling in and out every month. Um, I think I think the 2023, if I remember correctly, um, the, if I, I looked at the SIFMA report, uh, which uh, which compiles all the treasury data for every year and every month, I think the total amount of treasuries that circulated uh, treasury bills, just like up to one year maturity, was like something like 19 trillion dollars. So this is this is the stuff at the center of the storm, and all this stuff isn't real. Like, what's going to spiral out of control? The illusion is going to spiral out of control. It's going to spiral into nothingness because it doesn't really exist. Like the, the, that's what's really driving society crazy, right? That everyone's in debt and trying to pay off their debt and going into debt to buy a house and then they need to raise in their salary to pay off their mortgage. And then the mortgage needs the money to pay off its mortgage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all, all of that's going to spiral away <laughs> out of control. And as for pa Powell, what he said, Powell's just saying what he want, what he knows the market wants to hear. He wants, they want to hear something non-committal, not too frightening. It's like a lullaby, right? If, you, if your kid's crying at night and, you know, so you, see, you sing him a lullaby and then hopefully he goes to sleep. That's exactly what Powell's doing. But the, it, maybe sometime in April, May, June, something like that, something's going to happen. They're going to have to cut to zero. 
um, you know, overnight, probably not even in a meeting, you know, like look, look at it. I don't want to compare the Fed to Egypt, but, you know, this just happened right next door to me. So it's in my head. But, you know, you you wake up one day and you think you have a certain amount of dollars or a certain amount of purchasing power. And then, bam, the central bank, you know, allows the allows your currency to float after trying to peg it for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden you have nothing. That's what's going to happen to everybody, even the Fed. This It's just it's just another instance of it. It's going to happen everywhere. They're all the same, the Egyptian pound, the US dollar. In our journey through the tempestuous landscape of global economics, the specter of inflation looms large, carving a path of uncertainty that affects not just national economies, but individual financial security. The story of inflation isn't just about numbers ticking upwards on a chart. It's about the erosion of purchasing power, the diminishing value of savings, and the quest for assets that can withstand the ravages of time and policy. The inflationary trends we're witnessing today akin to those that preceded the drastic measures of the Volcker era, signal a profound shift in the economic dialogue. It's a scenario where the lessons of the past, marked by high interest rates, business failures, and economic recessions, are not just historical footnotes but vital chapters in understanding our current predicament. Silver, within this context, transcends its role as a mere commodity. It becomes a vessel of value preservation, a hedge against the inflationary pressures that threaten to devalue fiat currencies, the rationale behind turning to silver, or indeed any precious metal, is rooted deeply in its historical performance during times of economic uncertainty. Unlike paper currency, whose value is vulnerable to the decisions of policymakers and the fluctuations of the market, silver offers a tangible asset whose intrinsic value is not diminished by the printing press. Investing in silver, therefore, is not merely a reaction to the current economic climate, but a strategic decision informed by a comprehensive understanding of monetary history and the cyclical nature of inflation. It's a choice that speaks to the desire for stability in an unstable world, where the only certainty is the continuing devaluation of fiat currencies in the face of relentless inflation. As we grapple with these challenges, it becomes imperative to engage in a broader conversation about financial preparedness and the role of tangible assets like silver in safeguarding our economic future. This dialogue isn't just about investment strategies. It's about understanding the forces that shape our financial landscape and how we can navigate them with wisdom and foresight. I invite you to share your thoughts on the current inflationary trends and the role of silver in your financial planning. How do you perceive the challenges of inflation and what steps are you taking to mitigate its impact on your wealth? So the, the money supply becomes, um, it's less cash and more treasury based, but it still counts um, in terms of calculations that people make in terms of loans and all this other stuff. So um, what really shrinks the money supply are defaults. Right, because the once once debt is either paid down or defaults, then money supply shrinks. So if there are defaults because of because of this, uh, then yeah, the money supply would shrink. And um, who knows what bank is going to fall tomorrow? Today was NYCB. Tomorrow will be something else. There will be a group of banks in a few weeks that you know, uh, or, or in April that says we we can't pay down these loans uh, without some serious liquidity problems. So we need some help from the Fed. Please uh, bail us out again, and they'll call it something else and they'll give it a new acronym and uh, everyone will be like, oh yeah, it's just uh, the FTBX2Z version five, uh, you know, whatever. Um, but something's going to happen. We don't know exactly what it is, but there's a fault line somewhere and we're getting close. The only solution to this problem seems to be to expand the money supply again. That seems to be the Fed's, the Fed's way of solving problems is just throw money at it, um, which will just devalue the dollar even more, right? Yeah, well, there's two things they could do. They could um, inflate more or they could just let everything collapse. There's a, it, it, it's a binary path. There's nothing else to do. Um, and if they, if they, either way, and this is something that, that a lot of gold people gold and silver stackers don't quite understand. And it's hard, it's hard to really internalize it because it's, it's very scary. And you think that one path is failure and the other path is success, but they all lead to the same thing. And that is, well, if the fed decides to inflate more, uh, then, then, you know, a run on the central bank is the equivalent of, P of you know, New York Community Bank Court depositors taking dollars out of their bank, but a run on the Fed is taking our money out of dollars, right? That it's That's a saying that it's hard to register because like dollars are money, but no, no, they're not. They're a derivative of money. So a run on the central bank would be people taking their gold out of dollars by getting rid of dollars and buying gold, right? At 
someplace like Miles Franklin, as you know. Um, and uh, when everybody does it at the same time, nobody sells any. And then uh, <laughs> the uh, the the merchants are stuck with it. So that that's that's the end game. We're not stuck with it because we can trade it for other things. But um, yeah, so they can either print more and then people run after gold or they can print nothing and then all the debt defaults. And then what happens then is that the money supply shrinks so drastically as the defaults go in a domino effect, chain by chain by chain, all the way back to 1971 when gold was $35 an ounce. We end up with gold at $35 an ounce, except its purchasing power in dollar terms goes through the roof in the same way. So, you know, either way, let's say in a, in a, in a, in a hyperinflationary scenario, a house is, s sells for 10 ounces, whatever, five ounces of gold, whatever the number is going to be. Uh, and then in a hyper deflationary scenario, it's the same thing. A house sells for 10 ounces of gold for $350 instead of 30, you know, $3.5 million. It's just a question of how many. As we reach the apex of our exploration into the impending financial tumult, and the pivotal role of silver as a safe haven. It's crucial to synthesize the insights gained from the vulnerabilities in the banking system, geopolitical tensions, inflation, and the real estate market's instability. Each of these elements, while distinct, converges to paint a compelling picture of why the surge in silver prices isn't merely speculative fiction, but a foreseeable consequence of current global economic dynamics. The impending banking system crash, underscored by instances like the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, reveals a critical vulnerability in our financial infrastructure, highlighting the importance of diversifying assets away from traditional banking products. This scenario, coupled with escalating geopolitical unrest, notably in regions fraught with conflict, amplifies the demand for assets that can weather the storms of uncertainty. Inflation, a specter haunting economies worldwide, erodes the purchasing power of fiat currencies, compelling individuals and investors alike to seek refuge in tangible assets. Silver, with its dual appeal as both an industrial commodity and a monetary asset, stands out as a bulwark against inflation's erosive effects. The crisis in the real estate market, exemplified by the Evergrande collapse, further complicates the economic landscape, signaling broader vulnerabilities within the global economy. It serves as a stark reminder of the interconnectedness of various sectors and the ripple effects that can emanate from a single point of failure. The convergence of these factors, banking system frailties, geopolitical tensions, inflationary pressures, and sector-specific instabilities creates a potent catalyst for the surge in silver prices. As traditional financial systems and assets face increasing pressure, the intrinsic and perceived value of silver soars, positioning it as a critical component of a well-rounded investment strategy aimed at preserving and growing wealth amidst turbulence. In light of these insights, the conclusion is clear. The current global economic climate not only justifies but necessitates a reassessment of silver's role in personal and institutional portfolios. This isn't about panic-driven speculation, but a strategic response to a constellation of economic indicators pointing towards a period of significant uncertainty. As we conclude this exploration, the call to action for viewers is evident. In times of financial instability and uncertainty, diversifying with assets like silver isn't merely an option. It's a prudent strategy for safeguarding one's financial future. I encourage you to share your thoughts and actions in light of this analysis. Are you considering increasing your investment in silver or other precious metals? How do you view the relationship between current global economic challenges and the value of tangible assets like silver? Remember, subscribing to our channel ensures you remain at the forefront of financial insights and investment strategies tailored to navigate these tumultuous times. Together, we can approach the future with informed caution and strategic foresight.